with a slightly different story. We reopened last summer, um, but we have a smaller presence in New York. We've doubled in size out here since, but it was easier to get away with kind of what was going on in New York than it was California, uh, uh, particularly in Newport Beach, where, where there was much less of, a, of hysteria about things versus LA County. Um, but I, I agree with Josh completely that a lot of the technology apparatus pre-COVID was a very natural segue into what ended up taking place. We were big Salesforce users, we're big WhatsApp users. So there was the ability to use cloud and use digital communications uh, internally where we didn't skip a beat. Um, the difference for us is, and I think there's a huge advantage for us right now versus all the wirehouses that aren't reopened and don't appear to have any intention of reopening their branches anytime soon. Um, the client facing aspect of the business we have clients in 40 something states, we always have. There's a lot of remote communications, just like what Josh was talking about, when you have a, a national footprint. Um, but to the extent that we have local presence, uh, we really want the face-to-face. -face. And we think it was a huge advantage for us last year that we were able to get in front of prospects and clients, both through the second half of last year and all of this year. And it's, uh, we've reaped a lot of dividends from that. This is something I remember when I was in training coming out of dot com. I was at a firm called Payne Weber that got bought by UBS, and the then CEO, Joe Grano, was giving us a speech about why we didn't need to be afraid of the e trades and Schwabs and all this. And he said, There will never be a time in your life ever where the really truly high net worth are uh, that you're going to be disintermediated. There is always going to be an industry for advice. And people were worried about that at the time, what they thought was cheap trading. I think it was like 20 bucks a trade or something. Um, and I remember, I remember throughout COVID thinking the same thing. The idea that we'll get to a point where this very well-established desire from high net worth people to have communion with their advisor, to have face-to-face uh, -face communication, to have events. Um, events are a big part of our business too. Like Josh was saying, we've started up doing them again. We had 250 people at a client dinner a few months ago in California. So we're back up and running. Our first event here in New York will be uh, in another month. Larry Cudlow is an advisor on my team, and he and I are going to speak together. And that'll be packed out. And so those are the things that make you feel like you're getting back to normal. Um, but that the, the key issue for us is the face-to-face -face with the client. Where it's possible, I do not believe that can go away. I think people desire that personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And so what have been, I mean, we'll give this one to you, Carrie, some of the pain points that you've seen in the last 18 months um, in terms of the pandemic and how have you kind of overcome them at your firm? Have you seen similar things to Josh and David or was your experience a little different? Yeah, it's interesting to refer to it as pain points because I definitely feel that on March 17th in Boston, happened to be my birthday, when they closed the city because it was St. Patrick's Day and they said, everybody now, no restaurants, no bars, go home. It was painful to suddenly realize that we weren't going to be able to see each other. My office had not been virtual in, in the sense that Josh's, we worked together uh, in the financial district in Boston. And that camaraderie was a big element to the company and what we felt was sort of our cohesiveness. And our clients often would come in. We have clients all around the country. We have clients in uh, other countries, but we saw them frequently and we would talk to them sometimes, but coming into the office was something that they seemed to enjoy or going to visit them. And suddenly having none of that and people working virtually was something to uh, adapt to. We had the technology for it. We were all ready to do it. We had been using Zoom but a little bit. We began, began obviously to use it all the time. Um, I found that um, I have two very active dogs who were scratching on my office door at home. I said, you know, it's very hard for me to work here and I began to ride my bike into downtown Boston every day, and there was nobody on the streets, there were no cars, and there were no people when I got downtown. So I was in the office, I said, I'll open the mail, I can do wires. I mean, I hadn't done anything um, like that for years, but I was there, everybody was at home, and we just progressed. Um, and we had to learn how to connect in a different way. That, I think, has been hard, some people prefer to be in an office, prefer to talk to each other face-to-face, -face, the clients or my colleagues. 
Uh, I don't know if people, if there are people who are, really work better in a sort of close-knit uh, relationship type environment, work better when they're not in the office. Yeah, you know, there are some people who, who, who might, but it's hard to have that type of camaraderie, spontaneous discussion um, about investing at, as much when you can't sort of grab people, come on over into my office or into this conference room and let's chat about an idea. Um, so that has been a part of what we've missed and part of the pain. But we've, we've done well, we've persevered, we started to come back. July 6th, when everyone was vaccinated, that's when everybody was welcome to come back. And there are many days that everyone is back and some, some of the, um, the people or partners with small children have been home more. And some clients have asked if they would be able to come into the office. I think it's more a social thing. They're not seeing anybody. So, you know, we're somebody to see, uh, which, you know, we like. Uh, we hope it's fun for them. But it, it's been uh, you know, a big adjustment. We can do it virtually. I don't think it's much f as much fun. And this will change, of course, the way in which we do business forever, I, I think. So, interesting. So I think that's a good segue into, the, into another um, question that David kind of uh, pointed to as well, which is bringing back, when do we bring back employees into the office? Um, Wall Street has postponed their plans, although they're pretty adamant that they want to get um, butts back in seats. Um, some of the other firms have been a little more um, lax about it and have a little more uh, you know, ability to work from home. What are your thoughts? What are the pros and cons? Uh, do you want to start off, David? I know you had an interesting... Yeah, but it, I, look, I, I have really strong opinions on it. I wrote an article in the New York Post last summer, and I sent a letter to the CEO of 25 firms in New York. A couple of them responded to me. Um, I I've been feel, meeting too. I will. It, <laughs> Josh and I had a great interchange on it, and there was some cussing. And no, look, the fact of the matter is, I think every firm has their own problems to solve. It's a lot easier. Uh, my firm now has 35 employees. When you're talking about JP and Goldman and so forth, and there's, they have you know hundreds of offices, let alone tens of thousands of employees. I think JP's case it might be a million employees. I'm kind of more old school in the way that apparently Mr. Diamond and, and, and uh, David Solomon are about this. But to the extent there's some that feel differently, I get it. It's just I do believe I've built the firm around a certain culture. And so that brand matters. And I think uh, Kara's alluding to some of this. The interaction in the office is important for us. I also spent a long time in my career in branches. I was the managing director at Morgan Stanley for many years. And I never talked to anyone in the branch. First of all, they were all gone by two o'clock every day. I never saw them. And I, would, I got to know the people at our chairman's club trips more than I got to know the people in my own office. So the branches not reopening might be a different story in the wirehouse world. But for us, it's an important thing. So my strong opinions are specific around what I believe about my company, but then also what I believe about supporting the cities. I couldn't stand seeing Manhattan last year with these the coffee shops and the dry cleaners, the laundromats, the... the the bars, the, that type of thing, what it was doing economically to the city, I thought was awful. And I wanted to see the big employers bring people back to support the infrastructure of the city. And I hope that that will be expedited now here post-vaccine. I, 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 that's my take on it. Um, if I keep talking, I'll say something I regret. <laughs> uh, how about you, Josh? I mean, you guys have been across the country already, right? So do you have a take on bringing mandatorily bringing back people to office or no we're, we're not mandatory we we kept the office open last summer like david did but for a different reason i was not there but i have many uh millennial employees living in manhattan and long island city and brooklyn and they don't want to be confined to a 1200 square foot uh room all day and so we had a clean air conditioned 5,000 square foot space on bryant park they could get in, they could get out, they could be there with three other people and just hear someone else breathing, yeah. right? Like it's, that stuff is meaningful, I think, just to, to have somewhere to go. A lot of these people, it's 100 degrees outside of Manhattan in the summer, so you can only spend so much time out in the element. You need a second space that's not your house and all the Starbucks are closed. So I said... Let's just reopen. I'm not worried about the liability. I don't think we're going to have a super spreader event with three kids sitting at laptops. So that's why we reopened. And I've kept it that way. And what I've noticed, every week I go in on Thursday, 
We, we do a podcast, YouTube video there. We have guests. We made it vaccine mandatory to visit the office, whether you work here or not. Um, but every week, I see more people um, that work for us. And I even see people that work for us in other states visiting New York just to spend a few days at the headquarters and just see each other. So I agree with what everyone said about there is something to pro, um, there is something important culturally about getting together in person. I just think we have to be realistic. The genie's out of the bottle, mm -hmm. and nobody is thinking I'm going back to exactly the way things were. Especially people taking the Long Island Railroad, like myself, mm -hmm. uh, every day. They're, they're, so I think. So here's what I'm, the last thing I want to say. And this no, applies, this impossible. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> this applies to client meetings too. It's not that no one's ever going to want to be together. or meet, It's just that when we do do it, it's going to be really meaningful. People are really going to appreciate it. When you go see a client, now it's not obligatory. Now it's an event. Let's do lunch. And we'll spend the first 30 minutes. What vaccine did you get? I got Pfizer. Oh, I got, you know, <laughs> we'll all do that. But so what? It's going to be like a powerful moment that you actually put on pants and left the house so. for me. So, that, so I think it's, on the whole, it's going to be a positive thing because now we're going to appreciate, appreciate each other and each other's time more than we used to when it was just taken for granted and obligatory. Mm -hmm. A little applause for that. What's up? I appreciate you guys. I felt it. I was feeling that. Happy to be with you. I said Long Island Railroad, New Jersey Transit's probably way worse, but similar um It all sucks, so, right. Yeah, and both states subsidized for some reason. Um, how about we switch gears a little bit and talk about maybe portfolio management and if, see if we, there's any trends or things that we saw there. Um, it, it's, it's been a Did anyone mention crypto at this conference yet? Oh, yeah. Has that, has that come up? To they have a breakout on it tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, but I'm yeah. wearing something. I won't, I won't spoil it then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, what have we seen there? We've seen some unprecedented market conditions and certain low interest rates never seen before were there any different trends you saw over the 18 months of course we're going to get into crypto um but how, before we do that how about carrie do you want to start us off uh so if we're talking about trends well what we've seen the last 18 months uh, uh, this this isn't just the last 18 months but because interest rates have you know essentially been zero uh we've we've all had to invest in a way that um assumes that fixed income or cash or the equivalent is really only for what you, you need to have available if you're spending money or you need to buy a house. And its other assets are going to fill the entire pie, pretty much. I mean, that's the way I, uh, I look at it. You're not going to get any return. How can you charge people a fee when they're making so little money, you know, the fees more than than what you're earning on on treasuries or whatever the uh, high quality is that you're putting them into in the debt market. So we have we have done more investing over the last couple of years in uh, uh, assets that are alternative. Whether it's more venture capital, we've always done, we've done venture capital since 2010. That was the first investment we did in venture and. Private companies, we've seen more private companies. There are more opportunities that have come to us. We've done some private equity. We've done some real estate, real estate developments that, um, that groups have shown us. And we used to have, and all of us who've been in the business for a while have understood that fixed income would be a, a reasonable proportion of, of people's portfolios. Uh, elderly people um, who are retired, definitely, but much less now. And it, as the safety portion of the portfolio, no. So now we have other assets. There's more of it. We have had to spend more time devoted to learning about them. They have more people in the company who, who look at um, non-equity asset classes. And I, I think that will continue as a trend. I mean, that's what SALT is about. But it, it has never been as important, I think, uh, as it is now for nothing more than the fact that you can't have all the money in in just you know equities as um, as as one might unless you really just want to say that's the only asset class that we think is going to work and that's not been the case. So I guess we have to jump into it then. Digital assets. We can just give go 
in a line here and just give their opinions. Obviously, advisors need to know about it, even if they don't want to touch it. Um, what say you, David? Well, let me let me answer the other question because I don't have anything to say on the digital asset <laughs> stuff at all. Um, the 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 trend. It's really interesting to hear Carrie's answer because I agree completely. We've done a lot more with private investing. We've done a lot more with venture. Um, but I'm not sure that any of that is related to the events in the world of the last 18 months. In our case, I think that we just have had a migration of larger and larger clients that have needed those types of asset classes more. And there is a great deal flow out there. We've done a lot of direct deals, real estate, things of that nature. Um, but I wouldn't associate that with the COVID moment. Um, one of the things that's difficult for us, we have high conviction uh, equity investing. We're, we're, we're never owning more than 25 to 30 stocks, all actively managed in-house at our firm, but we're dividend growth investors. And dividend growth was very out of favor last year. And there's have been periods post-crisis where it's been in favor. And I, it doesn't matter if I think it's about to be back in favor or not. You could make a yield spread argument, some other things but it's never going to be tactical for us. It's always going to be evergreen. So whether or not I think it's particularly appetizing at this time or another is not really the pitch I'd wanna make around it. We believe in it because of the recurrence of cash flows and the higher quality underlying investments. Um, in all seriousness on the digital asset side, it isn't that I have any issue with those who are very interested in it. It's that for us, we have a heavy focus on cash flow and generative investments. We manage 3.2 billion at our firm, um, and we have roughly 85% of those in cash flow generative investments, either on the dividend equity side or in credit or even in alternatives and real estate has a, he has a heavy cash flow bias. Um, we definitely have younger clients that ask about it. We have folks that ask about it. I'm well aware that there are other firms that are building an incredible niche around it. Um, but for us, it doesn't fit into the principles we built the business around. And and so we uh, it's not something that has a big focus for us. Although we do want some Skybridge, and so I guess we kind of got yeah. stuck with some of it in Skybridge. Series G. Yeah, but no, I'm kidding. Um, they, they obviously have a little bit of exposure in there. That's our take on it. I think my colleagues up here have a different approach than I do. Uh, well, it, it's interesting. I did a panel for... Um, Anthony wants about um, cryptocurrency and and Bitcoin and I. He asked me which side I wanted to take, and I said I didn't have a particularly strong point of view. Which side would you like me to take? He said, Well, you can be against it, and um, and I and I said. <laughs> and then he pummeled you. <laughs> and I said, Well, I, I'm going to have to read a lot about Bitcoin to to come up with uh, something articulate to say. And and my conclusion was that it's a it's a, a risk asset. I, I think it's very little connected to inflation. I, I don't think it's particularly connected to gold. Uh, I think in terms of the safety and storage of value, uh, I'm not sure that Jeff Bezos has you know, decided that his money at JP Morgan, if it's there, isn't safe. I, I, I'm not sure that you, you, you need it as a store of value, but it's safe and I understand it. It's a, a risk asset that people can play as they do other asset classes that have a high level of, of beta risk attached to them. Um, do, do we invest directly in Bitcoin? No, we have an allocation to some uh, external managers that own Bitcoin, including Skybridge's uh, multi-stride fund. We have a portfolio like David, 35 names. That's our, you know, our, our sort of love and, and the background that we're from. I'd spent many years at Fidelity. I managed an equity fund. It was a growth fund. We're growth investors primarily. And that's you know, where my heart and soul is. But we, as I said, invest in a lot of places. If, there are, um, if there's a place for digital assets, cryptocurrency, I can see that for young people in particular who feel that's very important to them, as long as they understand we cannot analyze it in the way we analyze any other assets. It is not a confidence of ours. It may be for, for other people. I don't feel that I'm particularly confident in, but I can see the appeal and haven't um, d denied including it in, in diversified portfolios. Um, I, I think that when you, when you look at the wealth management industry, the average age of a financial advisor is 59. We have a very old 
industry, like relative to almost every other industry there is, other than let's say Walmart greeter. Like there's very few industries this old. <laughs> my average uh, certified financial planner working at my firm is in their late 30s. We're also bringing in a majority of our clients from things like YouTube and social media. And so we're attracting young millionaires and young almost millionaires, and in some cases, young quinta millionaires, deca millionaires. <laughs> Without a doubt, if your answer to these people is there's no cash flow, so I can't even have a conversation about it, you're not a, you're not a candidate for their wealth, not their current wealth, definitely not their future wealth. And so it's very important, I think, for an advisor to not roll their eyes, which I don't think anyone's doing anymore, but as recently as two years ago, uh, when the price had plunged um, from, from 18000 to 3000 it was derision at advisor conferences. That part's over. So now the question is, our question, we call ourselves evidence-based investors. Very hard to be an evidence-based investor in, in a realm like this. So then the second question is, okay, if there's no evidentiary way to do this, what's the least bullshitty way to do this for clients? Mm -hmm. That's a scientific term. Thank you. So then you're getting into questions like, well, are we really analyzing coins and tokens? Obviously, you're not doing that with a straight face. Uh, the people who created these things don't even know what they've created. So that's, so that's out. So the notion of like us actively managing a portfolio of crypto is ludicrous, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So let's, let's move that off the, off the agenda. So then what's the next question? Well, do we think that people should have exposure? And the answer to that is actually more behavioral than anything else. Do, if, if they feel they need to have that exposure, then the second part of that is, well, who should provide it? Should it be us or should we tell them, go do it yourself at Coinbase? And there may not be a definitive right or wrong there. So you might actually want to have two different approaches. Give them permission to do it themselves without hanging their financial plan out to dry, right? Or, okay, we will do this in-house for you, but here are the parameters around which we'll do this. And here are the software providers we're comfortable using. And here's what we're doing on the cybersecurity side so that we don't wake up in the morning and somebody from Japan stole, you know. You've got to go through this process and speak to the vendors. And in many cases, the vendors you encounter are in their infancy, right? It's, you're not working with BNY Mellon, at least not yet. We'll get there, right? So there are all these considerations that have to take place as you go through this process to find the least bullshitty way to do crypto for a wealth management client. Um, and then, of course, fees, costs, trading costs, hidden costs. So you go through these iterations, and then you say, well, do I want to be market cap weighted? Here's the problem with that. The back test looks fucking great, right? But you know, intuitively, Bitcoin's not going to go from $500 to $50,000 ever again. If it gets back to 500, you got re real problems, right? Mm -hmm. So you know that the, Bitco the, the, the Bitcoin back test throw it out. So what do you have? You don't have any cash flows. You don't have a so then you say, well, there's 100 other tokens and coins and various instruments. So maybe I want to equal weight these things because the next 500 to 50,000 might be among coins five through 10 by market cap. If I market cap weight, I end up with 70% Bitcoin, 25% Ethereum, and 5% all of these other science projects. And maybe that's not the way to get true future uh, upside in the asset class. So you've got to really, as a fiduciary, go through this in order, starting from how can I, with a straight face, say to clients, okay, I'm a certified financial planner. Now I'm ready to manage your cryptocurrency. It's very, very hard time right now for wealth managers trying to keep up with what's going on in the culture and in the markets, uh, but also not end up making a huge mistake for the people that trust them with their assets. So I don't envy any CIO at any RIA in this country. I, I really, and we have, my, mine happens to be my, my partner, and I always say to him when I overhear them talking about this stuff, thank God that's your problem, <laughs> right? I'm paying the electric bill. You deal with that. So that, that's, my, that's, that's my take on what's going on right now, and I think it's a fascinating time and a, and a challenging time because of those factors.
Interesting. Yeah, once it matures a little more and some of the bigger custodians get more involved, we might see some more acceptance or something. But yeah, certainly challenging for sure. Thanks for that. I know it was painful for you to answer the crypto, David, but I appreciate it. How about this one? Um, and Josh alluded to it. Digital marketing, digital uh, pro prospecting, all of these things came online. Um, and just speak to the importance of maybe social media, blogging, content creation for advisors. It's a been obviously hugely successful for Josh. You just mentioned a lot of his clients are coming on board through YouTube and other social media platforms. Um, what, what's your take on how, how can advisors kind of really... Yeah, so th this is an area I'm real passionate about. Josh is a master of this. He's been incredible. But I disagree with every everyone who tells me how well Josh has done because of the medium. I disagree. I think it's the content. The shit Josh puts out is super good. It always has been. Thank you. And, thank and if, you so he, much. if he was putting it out typed on a piece of paper and mailing it to people, it would still be compelling to read. Thank Those you. 1970s newsletters were kind of big, you may recall. And so <laughs> it's the recall. content. It's not the medium. Now, of course, he, he's kept up with the times and has found the right delivery of it. I uh, built my practice, pre previously the wirehouse, now as an independent RIA through content creation as well. It's a bit, it's different, but, but, but it, we've had, we have a point of view there's things I'm passionate about. I want to speak them to the world. And then I have absolutely no care in the world who likes it and who doesn't. And I just let the chips fall where they may. And I'm very comfortable with that. And so, yeah, social media, YouTube, television, books I've written. It's, there's a lot of different mediums out there. But this is all pre-COVID, just like it obviously was for Josh. David, do you agree that this is no longer a choice? It's essential because yeah. if we position ourselves as being partly... Or, or, or the psychological component being really important to whether or not our clients can stick to the investments we recommend. If we don't start off with people who are aligned with us philosophically in yeah. some way, and you're just randomly meeting people and putting them into portfolios, it's going to be way too hard to get them through periods of time like 2020, for example. Like I, I feel like you have that as part of your secret sauce, and, yeah. and some of the, the best RIAs today. They have that baseline of people came to me because of my ideas, not because I threw a steak dinner and they wanted to lick the plate. Like there, you, there was a point at which I realized that people were not coming to me for my good looks. Right. <laughs> and that, that uh, shared alignment of values, of, of beliefs, of whatever it may be, um, it's incredibly important because you know, we all are in a business that requires trust and the stickiness of the client is that they trust you through hard times, not through good times. The secret of the business and the great multi-trillion dollar, uh, I think, problem out there is that a ton of clients do not move from their advisor only because the markets have mostly been good. There's a ton of vulnerability in relationships out there. The ones that aren't vulnerable, it's because there's a connection, and that connection comes out of trust. For us, we build a lot of our trust out of what Josh's talking about. People believe uh, in what we believe in, and I think that's very important. Um, there are, are people that maybe are, like, not everyone should go on television. You know, not, not everyone's real good at doing that. Not everyone should necessarily write, but maybe someone in their firm, someone who has a passion and authenticity. I remember at Morgan Stanley when they were, uh, when they first said, we're going to allow advisors to do uh, social media, but you had to tweet like someone else's links out. So they'd have like their David Darst who, who, you know, he writes, he's a buddy of mine, like writes good stuff, but you were like a mouthpiece for the firm's content or something. And I thought, okay, I don't think that's what Twitter is really all about. That doesn't seem to, to do a lot for me. When people can start putting out their own stuff and you can just have a point of view, you can make people upset, you can make people not like you, but you then had that chance to build that connection, that trust. I think it's very important to what we do. Content as a service is not going away. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for that. We have about two minutes left, so we need to do a quick lightning round, just some final thoughts. Maybe we'll start with you, Kay. What's, what's the big takeaway for advisors moving forward? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you something that um, I, I think is increasingly important uh, which is that when people come to look uh, for you or a firm, they more than you think look at who's in who's at the firm. And when um, I mean, I'm obviously a co-founder. I'm a woman co-founder. I'm the CEO and chairman of a company. We're five billion in assets. Um, it matters to me. I'm. It's important to me that. Uh, Aureus is a firm with a, a woman CEO. It also matters to some of our clients. It matters who are the people there. Um, I, I, I know this sounds like I'm you know, spewing ESG. That, that, that's not what I'm saying. I just think that 
it is now a, a factor people will say, oh, it's really great that, you know, you've got a, a woman who's, you know, a, a founder. Um, I think having a, a mix of ideas and people in a company is important, but I think that the clients also uh, increasingly think it's important, individuals, families, and institutions. So I would just, you know, I, I'd keep that in mind. I would also say in terms of uh, content, because it's, you know, something we've talked, digital, um, Josh is a master. Um, David writes, I write, I've written a book, I write for Harvard Business Review, for CNBC.com, I'm on CNBC. I, I think all of that helps. I don't have time to do any more of that than, than I do now. And, and I, if I had more time, that might be more helpful. It has to be mostly performance. We have really good performance. That's what brings the- There goes your lightning round, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Takeaway for a financial industry, it's, uh, advice is not going away. The need for relationships is not going away. Uh, it comes from establishing competence and likability. I try to at least do one of those. Awesome, thanks. Josh, we'll end with you. I would just like to say it's been a, a pleasure Five. a pleasure seeing David and, and Carrie again and meeting right you, Sean, and Very thank cool. you guys all for coming to our session. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Give it up for these guys. Thank you so much.